Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to bring uh, the meeting to order. We have a full agenda at this public session today and some exciting updates that we'll be covering. Uh, building Metrolinx's safety culture, how we're improving customer satisfaction, the Mimico Go Transit oriented development opportunity, and a, an update on the Eglinton Crosstown Light Rail Transit and the construction of the Eglinton Station. Before we begin, I'd like to call on Greg Piercy, Chief Operating Officer, to lead our safety briefing. Thanks very much. Um, just a, a quick rundown, safety briefing. I'm going to go to Mark to do a safety moment. Um, so we have a two-stage alarm at Union Station. Slow pulse is a warning alarm. Fast pulse means you move quickly but safely out of the room. The shortest evacuation route is down the stairs, go all the way down to the main floor out on Front Street. The muster point is on the southwest corner of the Royal York. <coughs> uh, we have in the kitchen, we have a first aid kit, AED, fire extinguisher. Uh, we always look for hazards in the room. So if you look around, I would say bags on the floor are the hazards in the room, and piles of papers and laptops. Just be careful. For calling 911, looking to Helen. Thank you, Helen. Meeting EMS, is Peter in the room? Yes, I am. Are you behind the pillar? Okay. And the number of people in the room, I'm looking to? 54. 54 people in the room right now, and we'll keep a head count, a rolling head count. Okay, thank you. Mark for marketing. Thank you, Rick. So this is my second uh, public session, um, ha and I have the pleasure of uh, acknowledging and, and sharing a safety moment. Um, and this one actually is, is particularly uh, pertinent and relevant for, for the marketing team um, and myself, having gone through uh, first aid training um, in the first couple of months here at Metrolinx. Um, and there are a couple of uh, situations, and one I'm going to specifically call out today. Um, someone on our team um, was actually had taken the GO uh, train home. Uh, and was in the process of uh, leaving the parking lot in her car, uh, ready to return to her young children. Um, and as she pulled up onto the city street just outside the station, um, she was uh, caused to stop the car, uh, because the car in front of her had stopped, um, who was interacting uh, with um, uh, an elderly gentleman, a gentleman in his 80s. Um, he pulled, uh, he, he finished the conversation with the car in front, the car in front started to, uh, to move off, um, and literally as the car moved off, he collapsed. He collapsed, banged his head, and actually injured himself. Um, so uh, our team member, uh, Diane, actually stepped out of her car um, to assist the, the gentleman um, and uh, instructed other uh, individuals to call 911. Uh, in the course of waiting for the emergency services, she, she was able to have a, a small degree of conversation uh, with this uh, gentleman and, and actually learned his name. Uh, and his name was quite familiar because he's, uh, his name was very close to that of a, a very famous runner. And I'm not going to share that name with you because obviously I want to hold that person's uh, confidence um, and, uh, and privacy. So uh, EMS showed up um, and they did take this uh, elderly gentleman uh, to, to hospital. Uh, and uh, Diane got back in her car and drove home. Um, but had obviously been touched by her experience, uh, both, uh, both uh, intervening as a first responder um, and helping this gentleman. So much so that she took to social media that evening to share her story and, and actually wish her well wishes uh, on to the gentleman um, and obviously called him by name in, in the post. Um, by the next morning, um, the, her post had found its way to this gentleman's family. And not only had this gentleman had a situation where he'd banged his head and, was in, and injured himself and had to be taken to hospital, but for the two hours prior, he'd been missing to the family. He was 84 and was suffering uh, some, some degree of, uh, of, uh, of uh, dementia. And uh, to this very day, she still stays in contact with that family um, and the progress of this young man. Oh, sorry, young man. Old, old young man. Um, so I just wanted to share that. It's a very real um, a story that uh, traces back to the confidence of having the confidence to be able to intervene, having had first aid training. Uh, and we do have two stories like that from our team alone uh, in, in the last couple of months. And I think the other, the other story is going to be uh, recognized, I think, um, 
um, uh, I think by Don a little bit later, um, uh, really, uh, related to someone else on the team who invo got involved in a young gentleman having a grand mal seizure on one of our trains, and, and she also intervened. So it's very real. Uh, safety is important. It does matter. It also uh, does uh, influence and, and builds our brand and our reputation. So uh, a, really, a really simple, compelling story that I think uh, really safety does matter. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Uh, before we move on, I'd also like to acknowledge receipt of the following correspondence, which has been distributed to the board. Correspondence from Tara Reynolds, Deputy Clerk from the town of Bradford West, Gwillenberry, dated October the 15th, 2018, advising of a resolution passed by the town regarding the expansion of the Bradford GO Station parking lot. So I'll now hand it over to Phil to give uh, his CEO update. Thank you, Chair. And since our last board in September, we have had a few exciting announcements and achievements which I would like to take um, and share with you. Firstly, in September, we announced um, our largest service increase in more than five years with 220 additional new trips on the Lakeshore East and Lakeshore West. This is a, was an increase of around 14% in our service, but year to year, October to October, a total increase of 25% in our services year, year on year. <coughs> and in the next coming two years, we have similar service increases of the same scale that we plan to implement. This is a key part of delivering that higher frequency service two-way all day. We also have additional service improvements on the GO network that was implemented last month, and that included a new morning rush hour service from Malton GO to Union Station on the Kitchener Line. We also increased seat capacity on two morning and two evening peak trips that originate and end in Kitchener GO, expanding the length <coughs> of the trains from 10 cars to 12 cars. Every little bit helps. GO bus customers now have a new bus stop at Highway 404, and Major McKenzie in Richmond Hill. Customers will see more than 118 new weekly trips, bus trips across the region. You'd also have noticed that with Up Express, we have closed the partnership and we announced this new partnership with Uber, giving people another way to travel and to complete their journey on the Up Express. The partnership ensures designated safe Uber pickup zones at Union Blue and Western making it easier to get to and from our rail stations without filling up parking lots. Also point to an expression of interest that we have with ride hailing companies and watch the space. In the coming weeks, we will announce more, initi more exciting initiatives with ride hailing firms. We also reached a major milestone on September 24, when we received a notice to proceed from the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks for eight new stations in the City of Toronto. This allows Metrolinx to move forward with supporting the new stations for Toronto. And that would expand opportunities for transit in the region. I also want to recommend um, the 300 Metrolinx staff and emergency responders that participated in a, a trail, a, a mock-up train derailment on Saturday, September 22nd. It was a great day. I was out there myself and the disaster ex exercise provided us with valuable lessons and opportunities to improve our emergency and safety activities that we take. Subsequent to that um, exercise on the 22nd of September, uh, we have already had further follow-up desktop exercises to capitalize on those um, lessons learned. Really important to have these exercises before an incident like that happens. Also last month, a few of our customers shared their inspiring real-life experiences with our bigger leadership group. We get 400-odd of our senior leaders in the organization together once every quarter, and we talk to them about what's important in our business, and to have customers, real-life customers, talk about what the experiences are is extremely useful, sort of a, a, real, a real notice to our people of what's important to customers. And, and many examples originated from the day. One customer that was, vision, was impaired, with impaired vision, shared that how signs are, can be positioned better for, for sight lines and for recognition of the sign itself. 
And we did this <coughs> at, uh, as a trial at, at the person's home station in Hamilton, and it was very, very well received. And so those lessons get built into our standards and into <coughs> all across the network. At these uh, board public sessions, one of the things we do, and which has had great effect, is to get, give recognition to our employees for, for, the, for what they do. And I would like today to recognize some Metrolink staff that have, and, and staff from our, from our supply chain um, that have demonstrated their commitment to living and breathing our safety and customer charter. And I'll just give a slight intro to these different um, people and say, you know, every transit agency tries to deal with the tragic, tragic um, circumstances surrounding suicides on our railways. And at Metrolinx, we are committed to limit those and to play whatever role we can play in the community to avoid those happening in the first instance. And so all the effort that we that we put into recognizing mental health as a, as a serious issue in our communities and taking steps to engage with third parties to limit those types of incidents is really important for us. And our staff have been trained over many years to, to recognize these instances and to act on those. And I, and I would like to lift out a few examples. And I ask that Bonnie recognize two Bombardier crew members Andrew Hume and Sarah Ramden. Andrew and Sarah here. You, thank you very much. Now, Andrew and Sarah reacted very quickly and professionally. You guys can come to the front, please. It'll be great. When they encountered the person standing on the tracks on the Grimsby sub in Hamilton and safely, safely bringing the GO train, they were operating to a control stop short of the woman. Andrew and Sarah engaged with her and learned she was suicidal. Following emergency procedures, they notified GO Transit Safety and local police of the suicide attempt. Andrew and Sarah then stayed with the woman until she left the property. I uh, just want to thank both of you for doing that, because every, every life matters. And these are the two crew members that managed a very difficult situation and saved the life that day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. If I could ask Howard to, um, to, uh, to thank John Sorv and Chris Wartz. Now, Chris is not here today, but I've seen, um, I've seen Don Mitchell in the, in the audience. Don, are you here? I am here, yes. Hey, Don and, and John. Also Bombardier Go train crew members with the parting Ajax station. Please come to the front, guys. When they noticed the man on the rails running towards the, the <coughs> locomotive. <coughs> Blowing the whistle, but seeing the trespasser still running at them, they put the train in emergency and managed to stop within five feet of the man who was visibly upset. Following emergency protocols, John notified Go of the situation and contacted the westbound train to ensure it was stopped and no train would approach the area. Chris went out to try to calm the man down and waited for him until he was escorted safely off the tracks. Can I just thank the two of you as well? And Don, in, in, in Chris's absence, thank you very, very much. Again, fantastic and much appreciated. Charlene. Thank you. Charlene. Abby Canungo, a station attendant. Abby, are you here today? Thank you. Was quick on her feet and remained calm during a difficult situation when she saw two individuals on the tracks at Newmarket Ghost Station as the last train was set to arrive. Notifying transit safety, Abby went out to speak with the two individuals, successfully persuading them to get off the tracks and back up onto the platform to safety. She offered to take them to a nearby coffee shop to buy them coffee and food. And Abby's compassion prevented what could have ended badly and demonstrates the ev everyday efforts of our frontline staff. And that does, 
that sometimes go unnoticed. Not in this instance. We've noticed it. Abby, thank you very much. Thank you, Raul. So Lynn Longwell, Presto brand manager. Is Lynn here? Yeah, here. Come to the front, Lynn, please. Um, Lynn put a recent Metrolinx first aid training to good use when a customer was having a seizure on a GO train. When the emergency alarm sounded and Lynn <laughs> saw a man lying on the floor having a seizure, she was quick to offer assistance. And I dare say, Lynn, is the type of thing that comes from the fact that we've made first aid training such a widely acceptable thing. Otherwise, one wouldn't necessarily be so confident to get engaged, would you? So, so it was fantastic that, that Lynn got involved, helping other passengers um, to understand she had first aid training and asking them to clear the area around the, the, the man having the seizure. Lynn kept the man safe while comforting and keeping him calm until paramedics stepped in. Lynn, fantastic. Thank you very much. So, Brian, um, if you could. I didn't get one today. We also want to recognize staff from media relations and operations at Metrolinx who pulled together with approximately 12 hours notice to help arrange transportation for 200 high school students so they could participate in a cybersecurity competition at Ryerson University. Without the quick assistance of Scott Money from media relations and Graham Walker from operations, these students from across the GTA would not have gotten this unique opportunity for learning and exposure to post-secondary education. Can, uh, can, can Scott and Graeme step forward, please? Thanks, Scott. Just to close with a special thank you to all of our staff who truly live our values and demonstrate our customer safety charter in action, often going beyond and above to assist our customers in need. Thank you very much. Thank you, Phil. So the first, uh, first uh, item uh, I'm going to deal with on, on the agenda is uh, uh, our safety culture, George Bell. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to address you this morning, this afternoon, apologies. And we've seen some really great examples of leadership in front of you this morning, uh, this afternoon. These are things that we hold dear and that we consciously and continuously work on fertilizing and improving and growing within our company. Our safety leadership program is an actual program that we have underway in which we consciously develop our leaders. We're asking you to make a resolution today that you endorse the actions and initiatives uh, described in the presentation and that you help us further our goals and objectives in this manner. We'll come back to the resolution later. So the point of all of this is to live our charters. Our safety charter in particular is fundamental to what we do. We have as an organizational goal, the fact that we will live and breathe safety and security in all our actions every day. If we concentrate more deeply on the safety charter, we inculcate these actions in the work that we perform in the most minute detail. When we talk about a leadership program, initially we had an opportunity to bring in an external company and, and take a look at how we do in terms of safety leadership and sa in terms of safety competence. We decided to take that internally and we conducted our own assessment. We believe we know our business best and we're able to do that objectively and strongly. So we'll come back to that assessment in a moment. Out of the assessment, we determined where we were and uh, what the roles and responsibilities for safety should be within the organization and who should fulfill those. Finally, we look to make sure we have the capabilities and we offer the training 
to let all our staff live up to those roles and responsibilities. Sorry, it's not my... <clears throat> Sorry, I don't seem to be advancing. And now they post the slide. Okay, George. Yep, just keep going. People have the yep. slides. You have the slides? Yeah. Okay. So when we did our, uh, our safety culture study, we based it on the DuPont-Bradley curve. And... Um, that lets us uh, assess our culture in terms of whether it's reactive, dependent, independent, or interdependent. So when we look at those, please. The reactive stage is where we perform our safety duties because we think we have an, uh, an obligation under the law or under the regulations. The dependent stage says that it's important to the organization, but maybe less important to the individual. Finally, on the, uh, as we move down the curve, we think about safety as a game changer for us within the organization. And lastly, that safety is central to everything that we do. When we assessed our culture initially, we found that we were pretty much in the reactive stage. We were doing safety because we thought we had to, according to the rules. Um, we've really, we've moved a long way since that was done in uh, about four months ago. But as we progress, we need to see the fact that our staff, our employees, are owning safety, taking it internal, and doing everything that's required for that. Here are some of the results of that uh, survey. Employees thought that we were doing a good job of discussing safety. But on the other hand, they thought that our communication could be improved, we could offer better awareness and better understanding of the safety incidents and accidents that we have. They also told us that Reporting can be improved from the ground up in our organization. In terms of training, most of our employees thought that they received very good training in terms of safety. But we also recognized that our health and safety committees needed improvement and that our incident investigations were not always smooth and parallel. We have a very strong perception that we're a very safe organization. And we are, but there's room for a lot of improvement on that. And we need to help our employees understand how they participate in that improvement. And finally, in terms of safety recognition, you saw some of that this morning. But safety recognition takes many forms and is done in many places throughout the organization. One of the key aspects for us when we look at their leadership program is to work through six steps. And we do these in an iterative manner. So we understand our goals. We need to set our direction. We need to build relationships. We need to develop our organization and our support. We need to improve what we teach our people. And we need to make sure that we have accountability for everyone at the right level and in the right way. One of the important things to think about in terms of Metrolinks is that we are a leader-full organization. We have leaders at all levels of the, of the company. We don't only concentrate on our senior leaders. We have leaders from our front lines, we have leaders within our, within our partners. All of these people need to be nurtured and help to improve our safety for this company. Here are a few things we've done so far. We have uh, struck a safety leadership council. And uh, that council uh, comprises about 40 members and has met nine times so far. We are doing charter training. So these are on the, this is on the safety charter that you see in, in front of you. And we've uh, trained uh, about 200 people so far with a goal of training an additional 1,200 by, uh, by the end of the year. First aid training has been very successful for us. We have so far this year trained 1,490 people to be first aiders. We'll have another 30 classes prior to the end of December, which could range another 450 qualified first aiders. First aid training is one of the foundations of a safety culture because you apply it 24-7. You apply it at home and at work. And as we progress in our culture, we'll be adopting the motto, work safe, home safe, every day. We have a new form of safety observation reporting. This is a game changer for us because we've often asked people to report what's wrong. This will actually be the first time we're asking people to report what's right as well as what's wrong. <clears throat> We have a contractor coordination committee. Some of our partners sit on that. These are currently operational uh, partners, but 
by the end of next week, we will have had our first construction contractors coordination committee with 14 of our major constructors sitting on that and giving us advice as to best practices and receiving advice from us. We have trained 91 supervisors in incident investigations. We've restructured our joint health and safety committees. We're training approximately 200 additional folks in, uh, in joint health and safety. We have vastly improved our emergency exercise program. Uh, in 2015, we had zero emergency exercises. Last year, we had 18, and this year, we'll be on track for 24. In terms of safety recognition, we've already touched on that. George, is it perhaps this is a perhaps can help the board to understand yes. this. This list of things on this page is very much foundational stuff. It is. That we should do better. And uh, what's your degree of comfort that we have this year started it in the right direction? Very high degree of comfort. We can, we can tell by our numbers, for example, that we're getting a great deal of traction. First aid, we'll have, by the end of the year, 50% of our employees will be trained in first aid. That's a very good start. Our joint health and safety committee is really important for connection with the front lines. So that will be that membership will be almost doubled by the by the end of this year. We're in the right track. We have a lot of work to do. Some of those committees over time have become defunct, haven't they? Uh, they've become less effective for sure. Um, we had one in committee in particular where we had uh, seven members on the committee, if memory serves me correct, and they were representing some 900 employees. It's not an effective span of control. We had some that were designed to uh, look after some. Uh, scattered workplaces they had grown out of their out of their usefulness so they were looking after 20 workplaces it's not not effective that way so we've really revamped that top to bottom the um, uh, exercise program phil spoke to it earlier it's absolutely essential that we practice that we normalize our emergencies that we know how to respond and we apply everything that we've learned from the past to future emergencies we're on the way. And, and if we talk about the exercise program, perhaps you give the board a sense. There was something like, was it eight or nine agencies involved across agencies? Yeah. Um, if we take the, the broader number, it's around a dozen agencies that were involved. Lots of emergency response agencies, ourselves, Transport Canada was involved. Um, we had um, a total of 320 people on site during the exercise. So we had a lot of volunteers from the communities, from our own uh, staff who played victims uh, during this. Um, we have a, a very small uh, team that designs these exercises, only four people. And uh, they did a, a great job of bringing a very large community of response together uh, on our behalf to make this work. Sorry. So in your safety or charter or training, yes. um, how much do you utilize? Uh, I'm sure you do actual examples of catastrophes to uh, or previous accidents to train the staff. Yeah. I tell you why it's a question. I, I ran into an incident maybe about a month ago where in the, uh, the, uh, the system perimeter was established um, and the authorization to proceed uh, to work in that area was given without the actual supervisor walking mm -hmm. down, inspecting the site. And in effect, uh, a, a high voltage, uh, very high voltage, like outside of the perimeter, mm -hmm. hit by a truck and fell within the perimeter. Yeah. Right? And so it was assumed that that pole was, let's say, for example, was, was not alive. Right. So again, the idea is don't assume, verify. And, and my question is, in terms of your own uh, training internally, how much do you instill uh, to the players? Uh, number one, you have to verify. Number two, if you, you, if you give any authorization, you had better walk down that site before you authorize it for another set of eyes, because you'll sign on it. Um, answer if I, in order, if I may. Um, it's homegrown training that we have. We is designed and built in-house to Metrolinx. It relies entirely on Metrolinx examples. So what we are doing with that training is bringing our business back to our employees to make sure that they understand what has happened and what they can learn. But second to that, one of the important aspects of the training is challenging employees as to how to make these charters live 
in their workplace. So we don't only push information, we also draw information. And that gets feed, fed back into, the, uh, into a feedback loop, back into the training, and it's improved all the time. One of the major things that we've done this year in terms of command and control is we have, for the first time, put in place a very robust command and control uh, system for emergencies. So we have three levels modeled on some of the British experience. We have a, a bronze, silver, gold level, and each of those uh, command levels is responsible for ensuring the safety and the operational recovery of a particular type of emergency. More complex, the higher up the, uh, the, the scheme it goes. So those folks are responsible for making sure that safety at the site is covered, making sure that there are no additional resources required, and um, that a central repository of information is created live during the exercise. Then that is a put, turned over to a communication protocol, which makes sure that that information gets relayed to decision makers all through the company. So um, it's a very big change for us, but it's working well, and uh, it's going to serve us well in the future. Kathy? Yeah, I, I have a, a somewhat of a piggyback on that. Um, given that, that oftentimes we can learn where our blind spots are from other industries, are there other industries within this that are helpful in, in your learning? I'm thinking maybe aviation or do, do we use those? Because I know you've re referenced a number of external checks and balances, third party mm -hmm. reviews that we have, but they, they I think they're within the, the train world, are they not? We have the, sorry. Go ahead, yeah. Uh, yeah, the checks and balances are primarily within the rail world. We work with Transport Canada, though, who have oversight over all major transportation networks. We work also with the Transportation Safety Board, who again have wide oversight. Yeah. We have our internal experts have a varied background. So we have folks okay. internally from police, from the military, we have folks who have an aviation background. So we draw on their background. That's interesting. Something yeah. we can take away, though, is it? It is, yeah. We can do better. Um, here's how we plan to work on, uh, on developing leadership within the organization. We've touched briefly on improved safety reporting. This is important because it's not just a card that we drop on somebody's desk. It's a very, very detailed process as to how we're going to incent people, how we do incent people to report what they see in the workplace and how we close the loop with them to make sure that the reporting is not into a vacuum. Uh, there's a, a, an old quote that says uh, safety is like justice. It's not enough that it's done, it has to be seen to be done. So we have to make sure that people understand that we follow their uh, advice and we follow up on their recommendations and their observations. So that is, uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm developing a cold here. So, um, so that is, uh, that's something that's in play now and that we're going to be improving greatly in the coming weeks. We rely very heavily on partnerships. So we've talked about a couple of those, but we have some really interesting internal partnerships that we're developing to a much greater degree than ever before. So we're working very hard with marketing, or rather, marketing is working very hard with us. Um, our public-facing campaigns are far better, more diligent than they've ever been. We have a, a lot more uh, zing behind our statements. We were a little bit shy, I think, in the past, and we weren't weren't comfortable being out on the edge with what we said, that's changed. We're able to challenge people emotionally now. Our customer programs are absolutely integral to what we, uh, to what we do with our, with our safety piece. Our communications partners are with us all the time, both in response to incidents and response to opportunities. So when we, when we uh, tweeted or uh, when our social media folks put out uh, information on our exercise, we had hundreds of thousands of hits, hundreds of thousands of impressions. It's extremely powerful for us. And of course, our rail services and bus services are always integral to what we do. Here are a few of the uh, samples of what we do internally. While we don't want to saturate our channels with safety messages, we want to make sure that people get enough. And really, when we think about that, we have to think about it in terms of the recipient. So we don't want to be communication disabled, we don't be strategy disabled. So we have a variety of methods that we use in order to help us get to everybody. If your channel is uh, preferred 
your preferred channels to look at uh, news links, we have that. We have Yammer. We have uh, Twitter. We use all sorts of mechanisms to reach the maximum number of people. And finally, our training plan. So we're building this initially around our uh, health and safety committee training and our uh, charter training. But we're also supporting it with a lot of other training that we have in the, in the works. So we have already a very large component of safety training in the organization. But one important thing that we, we noticed that could be improved, our in existing uh, onboarding training for safety is about four hours. We're gonna change that to two days so that when people walk in the door, we're giving them a lot of information, a lot of strength on our safety procedures, policies, and actions. <coughs> and here, the particular emphasis has to be on new and young workers. Young workers are a very high risk group in any industry, and we wanna make sure that we inform them well so that eventually they become old workers. And finally, this, these are the things that we wish to do together. We're asking your help to empower everyone around us to be safety leaders and hold others accountable to being leaders. One of the best things I saw um, when I, in the last six months was actually a frontline employee who challenged our chief operating officer because his shoe was untied. That's a small thing, but it's a big step when someone will do that. Is it tied up now, Greg? Yes. <laughs> uh, we need to grow our partnerships. Um, the partnerships we have are excellent, but we can make them better. And that includes partnerships within and without the company. We need to foster our alignment with human resources and delivering training. And we've got a very strong partnership burgeoning there in that we are able to deliver end-to-end -end management of safety so that if someone is injured, that person is not, not abandoned, not left to languish, that we manage that through the complete cycle. We need to ask for budget. And uh, we've done that, and we've been, uh, been successful in our last, our last uh, roll, rollout. Um, but safety pays us money. However, it's not free. We need, to, we need to spend money in order to save money. And finally, our organizational structure uh, is, being, is being changed to support our implementation of safety leadership. And one of the major events here that has taken place in the last little while is the decision to centralize construction safety along with all the other forms of safety we have in the company. And that will change our organization. It'll change our culture too because it'll bring everyone to realize that we have a common goal and strive to reach that goal. And I'm finished. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. That was that was uh, that was a good uh, oversight. I just I was worried about uh, what you said about it's for the young workers because I just asked Phil to put me down for one of these programs. I might be too old for this. I'm uh, not sure. Well, I think for my 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 place, you you fit perfectly. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry, Howard. I didn't see you there. Go ahead. So, um, no thanks. Good presentation. I'm curious. Uh, in terms of, uh, you spoke on your partnership, and of course you have a multiplicity of capital projects on the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you have, for example, an integrated safety committee with your supply chain? Like those who are executing the projects, that's one. And if that is so, I'd assume that there's a walk down on site with them. And with so many projects you have, you must have a roving, uh, let's say, Metrolink supply uh, sorry, safety person or safety team we do. that's integrated with the project team uh, yeah. for multiple supply chain. Yes. And, uh, and if that is so, then uh, I, I'm, then eyes are so important. And I, I just go back to the, the risk that was held forth, uh, for example, the union uh, station issue. Um, so how, how do you, how can that be better improved? I'm just curious because I find the, the actual supply chain, those executing the work are so experienced. They bring into into the debate experiences from so mo so many other projects right across the world. So I'm Great. just curious on that. So we have a uh, safety team of 55 who are integrated with the delivery teams. And the action to uh, bring our safety team under one roof really is 
uh, because it responds to a, a uh, the executive safety uh, and security committee where on a monthly basis we uh, as an organization check across the organization how we're doing and make sure that we're all doing uh, things in the same way. Peter, okay. give the board a sense that th this was not the case nine months ago. We had to strengthen that right. team by, was it 17? Was it 17 we added, people we put into we that team? We added 17 people. We had an incomplete uh, program coverage. of doing uh, coverage on construction <coughs> projects. We've now enhanced that. Uh, not only do we have a corporate safety plan, we have a uh, capital delivery safety plan, and each of our delivery units has their own safety plan, which is tailored to the delivery stream that they're responsible for. Now it's exactly right, isn't it? You and your team go out on site visits. I've been out on site visits, many of them, a recent, a couple of months ago with uh, CTS, who's in the room here on Eglinton. You go out on site and, and have a look at what's happening and lessons learned, and you're right. Our, our supply chain brings lots of messages and good practices to the to the organization. And I'd say the best parts of our supply chain are, are companies that have their own strong safety culture, and their efforts help make us stronger as well as a team. And, and just on that, we, we have stood up a, con, uh, a construction safety committee that uh, is comprised of our 14 largest suppliers. And uh, indeed, we'll go with them to their work sites and we'll feed our information up through our embedded team and we'll uh, bring it to that committee and we'll ask them for action. We'll ask them for uh, stats. We'll ask them for results. And uh, we'll also be sharing best practices among the group and between the group and ourselves. So we've got a long uh, list of learning opportunities there. Okay. Do you want to talk about the CR <coughs> certification? Sure. One of the major changes that we made uh, in the last year or so was to um, require every major construction, every construction contract um, to be uh, fulfilled by people who have certificate of recognition standing within Ontario. So certificate of recognition is an industry safety standard. They're, they have to provide their safety plans and processes to the, uh, the uh, Industry Health and Safety Association. Infrastructure Health and Safety Association, who then vet it and then do or do not give them a certification based on their implementation of those plans. That's now a permission to play value. You must have core to be a bidder on our projects. The second part to that is we're requiring um, constructors to provide us with their injury record so that we only hire folks who have excellent industry uh, history. And we're actually fairly successful already. Our, um, indus the industry average for construction-related lost time injuries is 1.12. Our major contractors are at 0.75 injuries per 200,000 work hours. We have set the goal for them for this year of getting to 0.5, which is getting very good. But the ultimate goal we're giving them is 0 0.05 injuries for 200,000 work hours, that will put us and Ontario in general in the world leading class when we get there. The way we're going to do that is by making, setting targets for, uh, make it an evaluation criteria similar to um, cost of bid. So it is making safety as important as providing a cost effective bid. Thank you, George. Thank you. Thank you, George. So <clears throat> there's a resolution uh, uh, for the board to consider um, uh, endorsing the actions and initiatives described in the presentation uh, given by George. The presentation outlines the organization's plans to build its safety culture and advance its safety leadership program. So could I have someone make a motion? Thank you, thank you buddy. Seconder? Okay. Uh, any discussion? Further discussion? Okay, all in favor? Anyone opposed? No. Carried. Thank you. Okay. The next uh, next up is uh, customer satisfaction, and we have a a group of folks that's making their way to the table. Good afternoon. So we're here today to talk about customer satisfaction. In my mind, the most important thing that we do here at Metrolinx. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm uh, Jessalyn Selby. I'm the Director of Customer Care. I'm Karen Ollicock, the Manager of Business Development at Presto. 
I'm Devon Koshel, the Manager of Market Research. <clears throat> So as you can see on the first slide of our presentation, uh, we talk about our targets. Uh, we set a target this year of a real stretch target to get to 86% customer satisfaction for both Go Transit and Up Express. And then due to, thank you, due to uh, the growth that's going on at Presto right now with the TTC expansion, we set a target of 80%. These were all stretch targets that we felt uh, were achievable. Um, and what we've been doing over the last year is really putting together a series of plans to get us to those targets. We're going to go over a few of those examples in a few minutes, um, and we're also going to talk to you about what are some of the key drivers. It's not just about doing what we do well, it's about really understanding what are the key drivers to our customers, what that drives customer satisfaction. So we've done a lot of research that Devon's going to talk through, and then I'll talk a little bit towards the over 170 action plans that we have going on right now to try to improve our CSAT. Um, at the end of this, we will ask for a resolution. Uh, we're going to ask that uh, you endorse the approach and actions that we've laid out in our customer satisfaction report and ask that you accept that this is the right plan to improve customer satisfaction. And we're going to be able to give you a bit of a hint uh, that Devon's going to tell you that we already know some of it's working. Um, so I'll explain this slide just because it's a, it's a fair bit of complexity on the, the top there. But essentially at the top there is our goals for customer satisfaction and our recent tracking. So at the top there you'll see we, we did a pulse check and we had a baseline from July where satisfaction was at 77%. So at that time in July, what we really did is, is, is looked at that gap from that 77% to achieving the 86%. And those colors there you see at the bottom um, and, and at the, as part of the chart, they kind of they relate. So we know that on-time performance, communication, service and capacity, safety and helpful and friendly staff all contribute to achieving that 86%. And so we've done a bit of a sizing exercise to see what's needed to kind of drive each one of those categories to hit that target. Of course, as we discovered, targets move a little bit, and, and so we, we have to keep kind of each month looking at how those different components that drive satisfaction will achieve our, our, our ultimate goal. The idea with this is, is, is ruthlessly focusing on the important elements of driving satisfaction. We want to look at those things um, and not sort of worry about the other stuff. Focus on these ones because these are the things that drive satisfaction and are the most important to our customers. So for Go Transit, we've already completed a number of things that you're aware of. The expansion of 220 additional train trips on the Lakeshore East and West are having a great positive response on social media, and we're already hearing great comments from our customers. Um, I just this morning was looking at the review of the uh, new Go Transit website that was launched earlier today, and we've seen increased satisfaction levels on our website of upwards of 15 to 20 percent higher levels. Safety campaigns, bilingual announcements, those are some of the things that we've already implemented this year. Some of the things that we are working on to try to imp uh, implement before uh, next spring is increasing our real time. Customers are not as interested in just knowing our schedules anymore. It's what time will that bus arrive? What time will that train arrive? So being able to really provide real time information. Clearly being able to uh, increase our on-time performance and working with Andre Lalonde and his team to try to do that. But if we aren't going to be on time, at least tell our customers uh, when that train will be there. Uh, other things we're working on is due to the, all the construction that's going on, how do we help with the announcements on the train? Uh, we hear it all the time that they don't want to keep hearing those announcements, but we have to do them. It's a safe thing to do to tell them that certain doors are restricted, so we have to keep telling them. For example, my line, um, Stouffville line, I today hear three door restrictions every time I'm traveling, and soon we're going to hear six. There's going to be six stations under construction. That's a lot of listening to door announcements, so working on what's the best practice for doing that. So the slides kind of uh, have a sort of two page, so similar idea for Presto. For Presto, the key drivers of the customer experience relate to how people use the card, the different features associated with it, the devices and the availability of devices, um, problem resolution, so where do you go to get help, um, and then just that initial onboarding experience. We also have something in there at the end which is customer delighters, and so those are sort of the little intangibles that, that add something else to the experience that may not have a, a, an entire kind of uh, drive to the actual uh, satisfaction, so that could be something like Presto Perks, all of those other offerings that we put forward for customers. 
So right now we have about 62 action plans that the Presto um, and the Metrolinx teams are working together to implement for these customers. We work very closely with TTC and all of our service providers to implement these uh, successfully. Um, the TTD the TTC two-hour transfer window has clearly been a very big success. We've seen it in the media, um, and having the $1.50 fare discount program has also gone over very well. Uh, what's going on next will be our mobile app uh, that I know Karen's worked uh, day and night on, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing uh, that. Uh, as someone who's responsible for the contact center, I know it's going to really reduce our call volume when people can load funds immediately on, onto their card. Um, the Shoppers Drug Mart rollout has also been a huge win, and we're going to continue to push that out further. So uh, this last one is Up Express, and, and this is a great news story. So last summer, we measured customer satisfaction for Up Express, and we got a score of 80%. Through that process, we identified the key drivers for uh, increasing satisfaction. And this most recent summer, we measured again, and we've hit the 86% target. Okay. So I just want to take a moment to congratulate the operations team, because I just measure. Um, it's everyone else <laughs> that works very hard at achieving that, and there's folks out there right now serving everyone every day, uh, working every day to serve, uh, hit that goal. So, so congratulations. Congratulations to everyone. So there are 17 uh, plans that we have in place uh, for Up Express, and I actually went and wrote Up Express this morning, and uh, you can really see the improved level of service, the friendliness of the staff who are out coming and helping with us. The Wi-Fi uh, was definitely one of the main pain points last year, and you can see the improved experience for our customers in that area. Um, next thing is how do we improve our signage and wayfinding? Uh, Pearson Airport is a huge uh, element of how do we get customers to, uh, coming off those airplanes getting onto the Up Express, <coughs> and how do we continue to provide more tools and trainings for our GSRs there. So those are the action plans and some of the analysis of why we have those action <coughs> plans and what's keeping uh, all of our teams very busy right now. Uh, does any, do any of you have any questions for us? Do you want to talk a little bit about the control room idea and how you're going to control your actions and make sure they happen? Just down the hall is our, our con, uh, customer satisfaction control room. So it's a large room that has information about all of our statistics tracking. Uh, I'm a big believer in what gets measured is what gets done. And it's not just about volume of complaints, but everything as a relationship. How, do we, how does this work in relationship to number of people uh, riding on Lakeshore East? How does it work in relationship to web browsers? And how many different people are involved in a transaction? So we're measuring it. If you went over there, there's graphs on about three solid walls. And with that, then, is the action plans, because what gets measured will eventually get done if you get the action plans. So uh, we have, like I say, the 200 action items here, and we're, they're constantly changing, and that's what's actually great about this. These numbers have actually grown quite a bit, because as people are walking through, as Phil walks through, as any of you walk through, you guys see observations, and you tell us the stories of what you've gone through, and that's what gets um, even more action items uh, identified. So like I say, today riding the Up Express, um, two more emails went off, and two more action items were uh, put onto the list before the end of day today. So we're always looking for and always looking for feedback. It, that's what's critical. Is, as much as my team and all of us see it, um, we don't see it like our customers. And it's really reaching out and talking to customers and seeing it from their perspective, making sure their observations are noted, actions are put in place, and we get them done. And that's what our control room is all about, making sure things get done. Please. Can you say a little bit more about the Uber partnership and whether there's any political fallout from taxis or Lyft or so so what is that Mark do you want to take that one I'll take that um, so uh, we have just launched the Uber partnership um, which is a partnership with Up Express yep. um, so that is really about helping you complete the last mile or the first mile yep. from your home to um, to the to, to obviously the um, the up station. Um, we are, as, as Phil alluded to, working on, on furthering um, pilots uh, with, with, uh, with other um, ride sharing and, and taxi organizations. So we just concluded an expression of interest. Uh, so we're very excited about the role that, that, that those, these services play in helping that first mile, last mile strategy, particularly with the reality of parking. So it's not an exclusive then. With Uber. Um, so so the, 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 um, the partnership that we have on up is, is, is an exclusive at this point. Yeah. But in our expression of interest was ride hailing firms. We've yes. been very open and we invited taxi service, we invited everyone in. Okay. So, so, the go, so the go expression of interest that we've just concluded and we're working through the evaluation was inclusive of all transportation options, yeah. Okay. 
Okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. It's, uh, you know, it seems to me the only way to, for us to just keep increasing our passengers is to have great customer mm -hmm. service. So that's what it's all about, right? It is. So, thank you. Anyway, thank you. Um, so we have a resolution uh, to pass. Uh, I'm just trying to... It was up, up there. We've just to endorse the... Uh, the approach and the actions uh, in the presentation uh, to deliver on the uh, key performance indicator targets and the, for customer satisfaction. So could I have a... So uh, moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Okay. Always the penny? Okay. Thank you. Carried. Um, okay. So the next one uh, is, is, is an exciting... Uh, a uh, bit of a change for us, and that's uh, discussion on the Mimico station, um, where uh, we have some transit-oriented development opportunities. So, uh, pass it over to you, Leslie, to take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll introduce Lorian Hiniak, our Vice President of Corporate Real Estate, and our Director of Land Development, Michael Norton. Uh, before we get going, uh, the um, uh, what we are asking the board today is to agree to uh, have staff advance discussions with a developer specific to Mimico Station and report back on the basis of the opportunity that we're describing in the presentation in December. So that's the, rec uh, the recommendation, but I will allow uh, Lorraine to take us through the presentation and Michael. Wonderful, thank you, Leslie. Uh, today we're talking to you about a transit-oriented development opportunity. For those of you who don't know, transit-oriented development is higher density, mixed-use development that is connected next to or within a short walk of transit stations. It is designed to encourage transit use. Transit-oriented development increases ridership, decreases vehicle use, and contributes to more vibrant communities by better utilizing station lands. The benefits of TOD are well understood in both the 2041 RTP, the Regional Transportation Plan, and the Growth Plan. There are policies that are aimed at increasing density and intensification in order to support transit viability. We've had an opportunity occur at Mimico GO Station, and Michael's going to tell you about it. Thanks, Lorraine. So there are already planned improvements at Mimico, which include a new station building, which will be replaced, uh, which will replace an existing station building and will provide customers with an improved connection to Royal York Road. New entrance buildings will house elevators that connect to tunnels, which will dramatically improve connectivity between the north and south side of the tracks. Refurbished platforms will improve pedestrian flow and customer experience. These station improvements will collectively bring Mimico Go up to current accessibility standards. On Friday, October 19th, Metrolinx executed a non-binding letter of intent with Van Dyke Group of Companies, who are the owners of 327 Royal York Road. Their property is immediately to the north of the existing Mimico Go station. Van Dyke started as a builder of custom luxury homes in Mississauga in 1979 and has since evolved into a developer of master-planned residential and mixed-use communities, condominium developments, commercial construction management, and retail developments in Ontario. The premise of the non-binding letter of intent is that Van Dyke will construct a new main station building and dedicated GO parking, which will be owned by Metrolinx. In addition, Van Dyke will build a greenway in front of the station adjacent to the rail line. The Greenway is a multi-use path prescribed in the City of Toronto Secondary Plan. In exchange for this, Van Dyke would be granted the right to develop above the new main station building, which will be incorporated into a larger mixed-use development being constructed on 327 Royal York Road. Van Dyke will be responsible for the design and construction costs of the station parking and Greenway. Metrolinx will benefit in several ways from this new delivery model being employed at Mimico GO Station. Station access will be improved from Royal York Road, which will improve customer experience. The development at the station will increase ridership, as there will be people living and working directly at the station. Metrolinx will get a new main station building and parking constructed at nominal cost, which will save the Ontario taxpayer money. This TOD will also optimize the Metrolinx's own lands and leverage our existing air rights. 
Negotiations are ongoing with Van Dyke as we get into the specifics of designing and constructing an integrated TOD. Provided negotiations continue positively, Metrolinx will enter into the necessary legal agreements with Van Dyke for the transit-oriented development. As we move through the negotiations with Van Dyke, we will report back to the board to update you on progress and details of the development. Thank you. Thank you. So, that, that's the end questions. of your, yes, questions, please. <laughs> well, uh, um, as my colleagues around this table know, I've been a long time advocate for value capture. And uh, so to see this specific opportunity for transit oriented development uh, come to us uh, in Mimico is very gratifying. It was a prominent recommendation in the report I did three years ago on transit funding. So congratulations uh, to you, Lorraine and Leslie, and to Phil. Um, and uh, I guess the only question I would have, although it's uh, in, in, your, um, relation, in your negotiations with the developer, have you had any discussions as to, or do you have any idea as to what it is he wants to put there, besides the station, to build into that opportunity. Do you feel that the opportunity is being fully leveraged? Has there been any consideration to housing, for instance, included? And uh, do you feel you're in a position to offer uh, advice or encouragement to the developer so that we can be assured that the development will be great in design and maybe have social benefits as well? Shall I start with that? So the, the mix of uses, of course, the developer is looking at what is the optimum mix for them. And we've been exploring a number of items that are not exactly public right now. They're still commercially confidential. But suffice to say, uh, working on a mixed use model that would involve a range of different uh, opportunities, could involve housing as well as uh, mixed use or office uses. We're looking uh, to respond to what the developer wants to do relative to our needs as we move forward. So we have that in mind, but we have no definitive plans as we continue to negotiate. We'll, we'll work with uh, Van Dyke to see what comes forward. Maybe I could just compliment what uh, Lorraine is saying. Uh, all of this is being done in the context of working with municipal um, legislation in terms of land use, zoning, and so forth, and the policies that the municipality holds. So we will work through, uh, all in that discussion, um, parallel discussions to because to understand what it is the city itself its ambitions for the community the greenway is a fine example where we knew the city already had um, ambitions to uh, extend and connect the greenway so that's one thing early on we were able to identify as a potential um, benefit pu public benefit to the development as well so it will go through the full uh, municipal planning process Leslie as a follow-up to that I'm not familiar with the zoning uh, in that area specifically. Mm -hmm. um, as a planner, uh, <laughs> do you feel, uh, and familiar, as a planner who's familiar with all of this and, uh, and the importance of intensification where appropriate, do you feel comfortable with the existing zoning uh, within which this uh, development's taking place? Okay. So this, uh, this property that we're talking about has actually been uh, through uh, a land use zoning for several years. The challenge has been there's been, this is I think is about the third attempt to redevelop the site with a new uh, owner. So the zoning for the mixed use uh, and the density that uh, the current landowner is working with is, um, is what is in place and that is of a, a suitable, according to the city, uh, as the city has set out, a suitable density. Uh, obviously. Uh, we have to work new landowner, new opportunity with the station. We, uh, they may, it may or may not present other additional benefits that we'll look at. Thank you. Bonnie, you had a question? Uh, I had a, just a couple of questions, uh, Mr. Chair. First of all, how, how do we know we get the best outcomes possible when this is a single station? If you had multiple ones and you're sort of working with them at the same time, you would see some trade-offs through the process. And then second, Secondly, what, what will we do to capture the learnings from this particular experience for whatever we might be able to do in the future? To ensure that we're capturing the most value, we are looking at highest and best use mm -hmm. and running uh, market analysis and pro formas to understand the real value 
of these air rights and our property portfolio. So we are leveraging all analysis through consultants to ensure that we are making the right informed steps as we move forward in disposing of real estate assets, whether it be through a fee simple disposition or a long-term land lease. And I think the important thing, Michael, is just confirm to the board that there's a robust methodology to evaluate the air rights value. Right. We have um, a third party evaluating and doing a formal appraisal of those air rights to ensure that we are capturing the most value possible. And do we have the third party already secured? Yes, yes we do. It's on this. Yeah. And is that a bidding process or how do we how do we land that whomever's working with us? So we have an existing roster of consultants that we use to assist us for various aspects of our work and they've already been qualified and we they're trusted partners. So to your second question about uh, keeping knowledge, we have uh, Michael, who is our director of the business strategy and land development team, and the entire team works together cohesively, so the lessons learned are not lost. So it, it's a continuum of learning. And is it confidential who is doing this on our for us, or who, who we're working with on this? It is confidential yeah. at this stage. At this stage. Mm -hmm. But at some point... We can share that. Right. It would right. be shared. Yes. Thank you. Marianne, you had a question? Yeah, so thank you. I, I think this is a, an exciting initiative and will be a, is a case study really for, for Metrolinx and a real, and a, you know, shift away from the discussion of, of new, of individual new stations coming on board. So I think, you know, it's really to the credit of Metrolinx to have that design excellence department in place at this point to be able to re to evaluate this shift because if you have follow my drift there, the, the, the idea of these stations is that they should be consistently branded and uh, a seamless kind of experience for customers so that there is that design consistency and design quality. So we say design excellence, but really that is the quality of design, consistency of materials, wayfinding, branding, and so on. So I think that's, um, you know, again, a sort of shift in how this happens and you know, it has to be very carefully watched as it goes through the developer process because it is a very different initiative. Um, my question <clears throat> is about competition and how this might be viewed by adjacent landowners or because there's another, there is another property that almost, it's, see, I'm not sure which property we're talking about, but will this be, is that, you know, how, how do we make sure that we've gotten good sort of to the public competition around this um, opportunity? Or does it just mean if you have a property adjacent to the station, then you have a, a favored position coming into this discussion? So competitively <coughs> speaking, I can't see why we would have any restriction on people that want to overbuild the railway as long as it's done safely anywhere along the corridor. Uh, we'll do an evaluation of the air rights, and if there's money to be had from that, um, that is money that we can invest in the railway again in the public interest. So, so it's 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 sort of half the issue is is about to what extent people are capable of actually utilizing the air rights. In this particular instance, there was no competitive tension with anyone else for those air rights there's practically there's nothing else contiguous to this yeah, particular no, there isn't. property there was one party that could mm -hmm. eke value out of this or mm -hmm. could get value from this operation and, and this is the party we transacted with and thus the positioning of stations moving forward is a very <coughs> a very i'm sure of interest a very broad interest correct mm -hmm. so there won't probably be any competition because where that station lands has contiguous property and probably not three property owners contiguous, probably one property owner. But then in a broader sense, even if there aren't stations on, and anyone wants to overbuild our corridor, there's no reason why not. You mean say to add a station or to reposition a station? Not no, with, more, without more a station. the air rights. The air rights, right. oh, the air rights, right. Mm -hmm. It's really more the air rights, right? Yep. Don't let anything. And there might be some times like when we're, if we were to sell a piece of land or something where it could be more competitive Correct. than, than this, situation. this situation. Because yeah. right. then you could 
open it up to developers to bid, right? Right. And, and, think? and not to forget that one of the key criteria that anyone who approaches us uh, has to uh, have, re have regard for is the successful operation expansion of our, of, of, of our service. So um, what, whatever or however, there's a safety element and we still need to be able to maintain and grow our network uh, within that context. So that becomes one, an important criteria about determining what's suitable for us or not. Quick follow-up question. Please. Can you walk me through just the timeline here just a little bit? So we had plans to rebuild. Uh, we wouldn't have likely built up the same way that's being conceived of here. What's the impact on the timeline on the redevelopment of that spot if we do go to a developer? The main station itself yeah. Yeah. will be delayed, but we have provisions in the non-binding LOI to have a temporary station that is AODA compliant to bridge that gap. The tunnel connecting the north and the south side will still be built on schedule as per the AFP. So we would anticipate no service disruption here? Correct. No service disruption, no. Right. And had we done it on our own, it would have been completed roughly when? And when would it be done if we were to go through the TOD on this? Two. Yeah. If we had completed this, the main station in the AFP, uh, I believe it's the end of 2023. So that, that will be delayed based on the construction timeline. You want to venture a guess on what that delay? I think that's part of what we will be negotiating in terms of timing and sequencing and to identify whether, in fact, there could be any opportunity to meet our original schedule. I think that's what we would Possibly. want to do and right. wouldn't want mm -hmm. to speculate right this moment. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Now we have a so there is a recomm uh, recommendation to the board that uh, the board agree to have staff advance the discussions with Van Dyke and return to the board in December uh, with regards to the progress on those negotiations as set out uh, in the presentation. I will make that motion. Thanks, Marianne. Seconder. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, all in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, now uh, for the last uh, item, um, it's a uh, an update on the Eglinton Crosstown Light Rail uh, Transit and the construction of the station at Eglinton, which is a very complex little piece of work, to say the least. So, Paul, are you going to lead us in in this? I'll give you a brief in uh, introduction, and uh, and then I'll. It's my partners here. So, okay, thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paul Manor. I am the uh, project director for Eglinton Crosstown LRT. I'm very, very excited about that. It's a mega project, and it's something I'm very excited about. So, the intent of this presentation this afternoon is to give you an overview of where we are with regards to construction on Eglinton Crosstown, but, but particularly with regards to Eglinton Station. Eglinton Station, as we know, is a busy station today, operated by our partners in the TTC. And the, the, the plan is for that to become an interchange station, and we will connect with the existing uh, Eggerton Station at Yong, and that will become an, inter an interchange station, uh, and it'll be an extremely busy place. But of course, we can't just jump into that and construct at our will. We work very closely with our partners in the City of Toronto and the TTC in order to achieve these objectives. These are some very impressive engineering that my partners around me here that undertake. Um, so what we need to do is minimize the impact to our partners because they need to maintain their business and their service. That's absolutely paramount, as is what we've spoken previously, construction safety. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, be quiet. I'm going to introduce you to my partners around me are from Crosslink Transit Solutions. And, and they'll be giving you a brief presentation and a video. So, okay. I'll Jeff, you want to kick it off? My name's Jeff Vanderlee. I am the uh, Implementation Director and Deputy Project Director mm -hmm. of Crosslinks. Um, as Paul said, we have uh, spent the last uh, two years, longer than two years, working on the design of the support of the existing TTC box at Eglinton Station. Uh, the reason for that is that, as we will show you in the presentation, the uh, ECLRT cross uh, town uh, station passes underneath the uh, existing TTC box. So we have to uh, support that TTC box so that it uh, 
Uh, it remains structurally sound and uh, no additional, no, no excessive movement and no interruption to, um, to the service. Um, what we're talking about today is Eggington. Uh, we have a similar situation at Cedarvale, which is the station at the bottom of Allen Road. Uh, the process is basically the same, uh, but we'll concentrate on the uh, Eggington uh, station presentation. So Steve Plyler, who is the director, uh, the regional director for our uh, western seg uh, uh, region, and Peter Ojala, who is principal at Lee Consulting, uh, will take you through where we are. Can I ask you just a very quick question on the uh, Allen station? I, I have to ask it because I am asked by everybody I know, wherever I go, when will it be done? Uh, just on that one station, it is. it does cause a lot of... Um, it's it's huge impact. Where are we at that one little station there, Alan? Uh, we did a major traffic flip over the weekend. Uh, we had um, that intersection was uh, scheduled to be shut down for basically two and a half days, fr Friday evening to early Monday morning. Uh, we completed the work ahead of schedule. We got that uh, particular closure reopened uh, 17 hours ahead of schedule. Um, once we get to the stage where we have the area fully decked, um, the traffic situation there will become a lot easier. Uh, what is the timing on that? Um, early part of next year. Uh, we, should be, we should be in that uh, probably Q1, uh, end of Q1 next year, we should be in a primarily decked situation. Uh, we're just finishing off the, the piling now and the, um, and the decking itself on the, on the north side. Uh, and then uh, we'll be working underneath the decking and um, for a period of about two years before we have to come back. So once it's decked, will you be able to go to two-lane traf uh, two traffic uh, each way on Eglinton, getting on to the Allen? Uh, I don't think in completely all the way through. Certainly getting on to Allen, yeah, we're trying to open up as many, as many lanes as we can there. Right now, we, we obviously have half the road closed down. Yeah. Once we get to a full deck situation, we'll be pr primarily back to the original configuration. Uh, we'll, as I said, we'll be like that for about two years. And then from the restoration period point of view, once we have our station built, then obviously we have to backfill and restore the roads. So we'll be back into, unfortunately, more traffic uh, situations at that stage. Um, but we are looking at methodologies right now to accelerate that process, uh, subject to some approvals uh, from the city and the like, uh, to try and speed that process up. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry to be... Okay. Uh, Allen Road is also part of mine. Oh, okay. uh, So, uh, Jeff, you did... I don't know, well I don't know where that's on that. I'm not asked the question on that. Yeah. Uh, a lot of what we're, I'm going to talk about today is the same process that we're going to use to underpin Allen Road. And so w the first thing, I've got eight bullets up here. The first thing what, we're, we, what we've got to do is we've got to build a cradle to hold the existing TTC up while we excavate below that and we build the LRT platforms below the existing TTC. The project agreement that, that we have with this is, is very stringent, and, uh, and it's gonna, uh, you're going to hear me talk about three millimeters, and I'm going to talk about three millimeters quite a lot. I spent the 15 years prior to coming here uh, in the UK and, and working on cross rail, uh, also working on Reading and, and some other key mega projects throughout the, throughout the industry. Never have I been held to, fit to three mil. And, and so when, when we look at what we're doing here, it is extreme engineering to its finest and 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 we are we are uh, it is engineered it is engineered to do that when i first arrived here tim uh tim russell uh told me about the three mil and and my first question back was how are we going to how are we going to measure it because it's difficult to measure three mil the instrumentation that we have in place is uh, plus or minus 0.3 of a mil and so we can measure it once we once we could measure it, i know we can hold it up We've got the best engineers that we, that we could get all working together to do this, and I'm going to take you through some of that. But Steve, before you do that, just explain to everyone why you hold your business cards up. The business seven card bu is just to give you a sense of what three mil is. You know? Se seven business cards. Seven business cards. Now, now, seven business cards is a stop for us. That means I stop work in that area if, I, if the TTC existing structure moves seven, seven business cards. 
And so the maximum that I'm going to move it is five. And I'm going to take you through this process on how we're going to do that. We're going to reset it every time we get to five business cards to zero, and we're not going to move it. And, and part of what I'm part of what I'm real proud of, and, and the next slide is going to is going to take you through through my background. But part of what I'm real proud of is during the build that of Crossrail and during the build of Reading, passenger performance went up. My background is also operations, and so I am a, a member of the. Uh, of the railway operators in, in the in the UK and passenger performance went up. So we were able to construct a viaduct four foot away from a train system running 125 miles an hour and four foot on the other side away from a train system running 90 miles an hour. And we were able to build a viaduct right in the middle of that while trains continually went by us at that speed. So what we're doing here is just adds to that. If I go back to if I go back to the previous slide, the way we're going to do this, and we we check the uh, Peter's going to take you through the engineering, uh, rigorous design checks on what we've done, 24/7 real time monitoring. We're monitoring and have and have been monitoring the area now for a couple of years, so we know when when anything moves, and believe it or not, we're moving more than three mil on the buildings out there each day. There, there's movement in the area each day. We've got a comprehensive risk management plan. I'll take you through some of what that is and tight coordination between Metrolinx and the TTC to develop what we're going to do and also ourselves. And I'm going I'm to tell you how we're going to do that. And we want to do that with no interruption to the subway service. If we, if we go through uh, background, I, I told you about my operating background as a member, to, member of the operate, Institute of Railway Operators, but also worked on Reading Station, which iconic station that uh, the Queen opened up, and also worked on Crossrail, uh, the overland portion of it, which is now in service. With, a, with the biggest part of, of that and what I'm most proud of, we worked 460,000 man hours in nine days in a nine day period to, to break the back on that. And so when you look at that, around 6,000 people per day, and that was done two years ago, opened the railway back up on time. And so at this point, uh, Peter Ajala is our lead structural engineer, and I'll, I'll let Peter introduce himself. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for uh, having us here today. I'm hoping at the end of uh, what we show you that we can give you a good understanding for the very, very important and vital work that's about to start both at Cedarvale and, and Allen stations. Uh, it's something that you rarely see being done, but it's uh, absolutely vital to integrating these transportation lines, and so uh, that's what I'll try and do. <clears throat> My background, I'm a principal with a Canadian consulting engineering company called uh, Lee Consulting. We have about 1,400 employees worldwide. <laughs> We're privately held. Uh, I work in the heavy structural, and that means that I, I engineer bridges, transit stations, underground subway stations, uh, we've done it. We do a lot of work for the TTC. We're leading two stations right now in the DRL at Pape and Girard, and we're designing the largest station on the Young Extension, it's just getting underway at Richmond Hill. I was the lead engineer on Finch West as well. On this project, I've been working for about six years. We started with a, a post EA assignment for Metrolinx, your conception, conceptual stations assignment. I led that project. It kind of kicked off the design phase. Uh, for you, and we did some RCD designs before I transferred over to the contracting team. So, a bit of an intro there. Okay, I'll orientate you with the area that we're talking about. And the next slide, Eglinton Avenue runs east-west, uh, and then we've got Young Street running north-south. The TTC runs kind of parallel to Young Street, and as you can see, the area that we're talking about, building the cradle, is the area on that slide that is in red. And, and so we're going to build a cradle up underneath that, and we, we began that work. We, the structural piles, uh, those of you that, that have been in the area, you've seen a piling rig working in that area. The structural piles are in at this time. And, and so soon we'll, we'll be excavating, and we will be below, below ground, and you won't know we're there. All right, this is, a, this is a, a rendering of what the station looked like. The box that I told you that we're going to hold up the, in, in pink is the TTC, the current TTC. So we're going to build a cradle to hold that up, and then we're going to excavate down 13 meters or 14 meters, and then we're going to start building the LRT station and coming back up. 
And and so that's that's a rendering of how that of how that is. Back to the three mil. Three mil. Now, if if we were monitoring track and we were looking at the at, at our trains and track, you have a plus or minus three mil on your surveys that are done. And and so plus or minus three mil, but we're gonna measure this to three mil to ensure there is no interruption to the traveling public. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Peter right now, and, and Peter's going to tell you how exactly how we're going to do that. So, Steve mentioned this three millimeter stop work limit. Uh, for engineers, that means that we're actually targeting for something less. And so we've designed the structure that will support the TTC for a two millimeter engineering target movement. This is a very, very stringent criteria. But what it means is that every part of the engineering gets looked at stepwise, methodically, to every detail. Uh, it also means that it, the end result is a very heavy structural steel frame that will be built here uh, under the subway. What, what this slide on the, or the screenshot there gives you is a bit of an overview of some of the key elements that will appear in the video and, and will give you a bit of a context when you see that video in a few minutes. And what you're seeing there is a, is a partial <coughs> excavation. So the, I don't know if I've got a pointer here, but no, you uh, don't. okay. So at the top of that, you can see the TTC subway. To the left is north, and you can see the the underpin structure and a partial excavation under the subway. The first step is we install heavy foundations to each side of the subway. Those are the the three steel vertical supports that you see. The three on on this side of the of the subway. There are three on the opposite side. Those are in place right now. Those have been installed, and there's deep foundations that are about 40 meters below Young Street. So when we take the excavation down to the base of the subway, the first step will be to methodically and over a relatively long period of time trench in individual what we call galleries to, to install heavy structural steel supports. Those will run... Uh, those will run under the subway from each side and be supported on a side girder that you can, I think you can see running along the side of the subway. So the side girder is supported on the three structural steel columns and each of six individual underpinning girders will be trenched in under a carefully sequenced process under the subway, attached to the side girder and then jacked individually one by one with each trench to transfer the load that is currently supported by the soil onto that steel structure. So we work methodically, we work step by step. To install one of those underpinning girders probably takes two and a half weeks. So what you see is a screenshot of months of work. It's, it's, uh, it will be bitten off and executed in very small chunks through the course of, of a year plus to build this underpinning. It's conventional construction. Uh, plus, it's been tried uh, in, a, in a certain sense. Some of the details that I'm going to show you on TTC work on a, on a project that actually my company uh, engineered as well. As we move down the excavation, again, it's a methodical approach. We reinforce the soil mass that remains under the subway. We, we in fact, strengthen it. If you're familiar with reinforced earth retaining walls that you see when you drive along the highway system, those have big steel tiebacks that run back into the earth. We're pre-doing that on each side of the subway. Then we go in and we excavate through earth berms, one by one, uh, small panels. We tension those tiebacks. We put in a concrete facing to tie back the wall. We apply active load to the subway, and we do this again in small chunks working through the excavation, 1.2 by 1.5 meter panels. We start to move down the excavation as we go. So it's controlled in every uh, part of the operation, and it's been analyzed that way as well, geotechnically and structurally. We cut off groundwater. There's a, and there's a cutoff wall at, at greater depth when we can get equipment in to do that. We proceed down with that excavation right to the bottom of the, of the ECLRT, which is about 13 and a half meters below the, the base of the subway. So those are kind of the main elements. The reason I spent some time with that slide is to, you're going to see these installed in a, in a sequenced way that'll give you more of a, so this is just more or less to give you context of, of what you'll see in a minute. Okay, how do I change this? Thing? Next green one. Green one? Okay. I mentioned a TTC project. If you ever have the opportunity to go down to line two, approaching Kiel Station, 
uh, part of the TTC subway is elevated there. And uh, there was a, a relatively urgent structural problem at three spans there, uh, which required what we would call, in a structural sense, underpinning. In this case, it's permanent. Uh, but um, you talk about two millimeter work uh, movement limits for heavy structure. This one was engineered to one millimeter. We executed the work. You can see that structure in place if you ever happen to drive down there. It's, it's in a parking lot under the subway. Uh, heavy caisson foundations at depth. And to a larger scale, the kind of the bolt arrangement and the jacking uh, corbel places that you see there, but getting too technical, are repeated in a larger way on the adjustment details that are built into the engineering for both Eglinton Station and will be followed as well at Cedarvale. So it's, it's, a, it's not the first time, and it's, it's a very conventional system that we're, that we're following here. Now, to do that work or to engineer it, you know, <coughs> need a great contractor. We have Western Mechanical on our construction team. They're one of the premier jacking contractors in the country. There's a couple of their projects. That's a large bridge they lifted and moved laterally at Fort Erie, Ontario. And on, on this project, your project, uh, the Kodak building. So they were, the, they were the contractor that lifted, jacked that building and got it ready to move to its, its current location. Five firms worked on this, all in, in various parts of the engineering work over the last two years of fairly intensive work. I've been working on the project for about four years. It's, it's time enough. Uh, we have a, an excellent engineering company in Thurber Engineering. So every stage of the excavation looked at in detail stability for the soil mass under the subway, movement studies for, for every step of the work. Same for the structural engineering. We engineered the underpinning system, the, the heavy foundations. We had a, a partner firm, Brown & Co., who were doing parallel work to trench in, to do the individual trenches you'll see in a minute in the video on how to get in that structural steel underpinning. And so we were comparing results. In other words, we had two independent groups looking at the same thing using different engineering approaches, different software as counter checks within Crosslinks Transit Solutions on the, on the work. Um, Isherwood, uh, the largest shoring uh, designer in, the, in probably in Ontario, uh, they did the facing designs and the what we call tieback anchor designs for the, for the excavation shoring. And Geo Foundations, Keller Group, who are experts in cutoff walls and jet grouting, that's the water control at the, at the deeper elevations. So that's, that's kind of the group that worked together, and it's been a coordinated effort basically focusing on the end result. We're just giving you a bit of an overview on today, over two years. And so there's, you know, in engineers, if there are any structural engineers, there, it's all 3D engineering. The end result in a structural sense is a structural steel cradle you see in the graphic to the right. Uh, every step of the operation, stage by stage, has been examined. We're controlling movements to two millimeter engineering target. Our stop work is three millimeters at the TTC structure joints. When we excavate a gallery under the TTC, we expect we're going to move the subway about a millimeter to a millimeter and a half. When we recompensate over that individual girder by our electronically controlled jacking system, essentially we replace the load that we have removed and we restore that movement. And that's part of the way that we're able to control this to such a, a close standard. Um, and the, the biggest, uh, probably the biggest feature that I, I should touch on a little bit more is that all of this work will be executed from outside the subway. So as we did for the Keel Trestle project that I highlighted earlier, we're not planning any impacts on subway operation at all during this work. Okay. Now, you get a good engineering solution, thoroughly thought through, um, and, but you need data from the field. And what, what this shows is a graphic at this particular crossing location where the temporary supports will go in. We'll have multi-point monitors on top of the subway roof that are giving us readings to less than half a millimeter on where is that elevation. We're going to, we have sensors that cross each of the contraction joints. So the subway is made up of a series of structural units of about 55 to 60 meters, 18 meters in length, linked one to the other, not connected, but free. And that, that's where the three millimeter movement criteria becomes important. You don't want to cause any issues at the track. Although, Steve, you know, it's really three millimeters is a very, very severe criteria. Um, 
So we have sensors at each of those joints. We're going to have strain gauges on the steel columns. We want to know what load is in those columns when we first load them. We want to know if there's any change in that load that's a precursor to being able to detect movement. And we're doing the same in the bracing systems and so forth that will tie back to the subway. So that's a bit of an overview on the engineering. I'll turn it over to Steve. Okay, we're going to control this with an operations room, and the operations room will operate 24-7, so we will have a manager in there, a member from the Metrolinx team, as well as a member from the TTC team, at least when we first uh, start. Uh, communication plan will be in place. Uh, we'll have a 10 a.m. engineering meeting, but the 10 a.m. engineering meeting will happen more frequently if necessary should we see, should we encroach on the two mil. Uh, status reports will be issued twice daily to the key stakeholders. Uh, this weekend, I know that uh, Peter was on, on our status reports and was receiving how Allen Road and the, what the progression was, was going on on Allen. So we will keep those executive reports coming out. We'll have a full list of what our contingency uh, equipment is and an es escalation protocol as, all, as well as we'll do our shift handover from there. At, at this point, uh, Tim, would, would you like to take us through the, sure. the video? Yeah, I'd be very pleased to. And I'm, I'm just going to, if it's okay, I'll stand at the back here so I can communicate with your technician. Uh, I'd like to be able to pause the video in a few moments. Yes. You'll need to be near a microphone. Oh, okay. People on the webcast can hear you. Okay. Ask a question while you're sure. setting that up. So when when you talk about the one of the first slides, the two LRT stations, I was thinking is are they one on either side of the road? No. No, the second one is the station at Allen, Eglinton oh, South. I see, I see so it's the station at Allen Road. And you call the, that the process is is identical. I see. To, to what we're doing here, we're going to cradle it. We're we're going to and the the tolerances are identical to what we're doing here. Yeah. The thing is, so those those red columns stay in place, obviously. Well, uh, one of them gets integrated into the permanent work. The one that's right in the middle of the station. Well, the that's other, right, because the because the because the train the other two are in their trainways, so they'll they'll eventually be yeah, removed. Yeah, because there's a and because we visited the tunnel, went down the tunnel, so I was trying to rationalize how that okay. station hits the hits the. So the um, you saw three columns there on each side of the TTC, and the ECLRT station going under the TTC. The two outer columns are dead in the middle of the trainway, and the center column is right in the middle of the center platform. So we can integrate the center platform into the final structure, permanent structure we have, but the two on the outside will get cut out after we've built up ECLRT and, and permanently supported the subway in place. Do you have a quick follow-up question? Just before we get going on this, you keep bringing up the three millimeters. Who decided it was three millimeters? The second question is, if not you, do you agree with that? put so much emphasis on this answer the first it, question only <laughs> okay uh, it, it was it was part of the project agreement and yeah. uh and it was a ttc and, requirement the, yeah. the ttc re, the ttc required that that uh three millimeters i haven't worked to that that in the past it's always been around 10 millimeters working with the railway that i have previously worked with so, I know where you're going with the second question. And <laughs> let me take that. I'll take a different one offline. With TTC design requirements are an integral part of the project in Eglinton. So the, uh, the team works to those design standards. It sounds like it's an exacting standard. Mm. Yeah, it's very exacting. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk here. Uh, before we press play, uh, I will just uh, a few. Uh, preliminary comments. You've heard Peter talk about the support scheme, the very robust structural scheme that will install the uh, uh, immense reinforcement of the soil mass below the subway, either side of that support structure. Of course, to install all of that, we have to do some excavation, and every time we excavate, there's an opportunity for some uh, relaxation of the soil. And so a key part of the risk management is to, is to keep the soil mass intact and stable. And the approach to do that is very simple. It's to do it in very, very small steps. So you can just like this. And so you're going to see an aerial view from the south, looking north, Young Street, up and down the screen, Eglinton, left to right. We'll rotate around, the camera will rotate around to the west. And the area highlighted in yellow at street level is the portion 
of the subway that will be supported. And the little white circles are the, the structural caissons. We're heading down the vertical are the support walls of the excavation. We're going to excavate either side of the subway, install a support wall that allows us to build the galleries in a controlled manner. And if we can pause there, and the very large red element is a immense steel girder that will carry the support beams underneath the subway. We excavate about two metres to an elevation two metres below the floor of the subway. And here we're going to start our very first tunnel. So we pause and progress a little. Pause there. Perfect. And so here is a small excavator. That, that excavator that you see there would fit on this table to my right. It's a very small machine. The, the, the piece of soil that it's excavated is about 1.2 metres by 1.2 metres by 2 metres. It takes us about five, metre, five minutes. And once that's complete, we're going to apply a concrete support structure to the face and the walls and the floor of that excavation. The moment, the time of exposure is virtually minutes. That concrete will become hard in about 10 minutes and provide structural support in 30 minutes. Please press play. And then we do the bottom portion of that cut and introduce, pause, and we complete the bottom portion of that cut, introduce a pair of structural columns that replace the support that that soil was providing. And that's about a day to do that operation that I've just described. And then that gets repeated each day as we progress into that tunnel. <coughs> and so the tunnel is developed from one side, from the west to the east, in about a 10 to 12 day operation. So this is a very, very meticulous construction uh, process. Pause. And then the first of the support beams is installed. We uh, uh, jack load, uh, transfer the load from those blue columns onto that support beam and repeat the process for the next gallery. Didn't the tunnel digger go right through there? Or, or it didn't go? The, the, tunnel, the, the tunnel digger did not. Uh, the tunnels were terminated uh, about 100 metres east and 100 metres west of this particular of line one, both it's at Eglinton West and at Eglinton Station. So Eglinton, what, what's known as Eglinton West Station on on the system is what is referred to as Cedarvale on the on on the cross town. Second second support beam installed, and then that process is repeated for the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth. So now that central portion of the subway is supported on a very robust structural steel cradle, and it is it pours there, and it is it is cradled in a very gentle manner. We we have enormous control over the loads and the elevations of that subway unit. And now we proceed with the excavation below that support structure, and again the emphasis is on very very small steps. And here you can see, pause there please, and here you can see an, an earth berm. And that's, this earth berm is providing support to the face of excavation. We drill our anchors through that berm and then we're going to excavate following the colour coding of this that you see there. So on day one we'll excavate the red panels and we'll concrete the face, tension the cables. On day two we'll excavate the blue panels and on day three we'll do the yellow panels. So the, and so the, the, the exposure at any point in time is extremely limited. And now repeat that process as we expect down to what will be the platform level, platform elevation of the, of the LRT. Just a second, close. And construct the, the LRT station back up. And all of the elements you see uh, in red there will, uh, apart from four of the columns, will become part of the permanent support structure. Thank you very much. Hey, I, I, I'll take you through the, the the phase of the operation. Depending on the phase of the operation, we're going to install or the risk and and how we're going to do that. I just skip right down to the to the risk. Uh, one of the risks is the failure of the jacks, and so the jacks fail safe. 
Should we be holding it up and all the jacks fail, they fail safe and we can manually operate those so we can continue with our movement. A dove above limit differential of the settlement of the units, we're gonna measure, we're gonna stop and readjust at two mil. And, and so we're all, it's constant. The pile, piles that we put in or the structural caissons, we know they're gonna settle 10 mil. So we're adjusting for that and our computers are adjusting, constantly adjusting for that. So uh, soil mass settlement, uh, water is is not our friend. Uh, this past year we had a 10-year rain event at Eglinton. Uh, we have renewed the storm sewer system in the Eglinton area. That handled all of the water we had at Eglinton. And and as you're aware, uh, the flooding was was uh, pretty severe in other places. We've also relocated all all of the wet and dry utilities, so they're they're outside of our area in our our zone of influence right there. And, and uh, what happens if we hit response, response level alert three? We stop work. That's just an engineering for us. That's an engineering reset. We stop work. Our structural engineers will tell us what we need to do. We'll raise the structure back up, reset to zero, and then we will commence work again. At no time, even if it is at three, at no time will, we pose, will it pose a threat to the TTC. Operational response to what will happen if we do reach that, uh, level, we're still developing that jointly with the TTC, and uh, and hopefully we'll have that work soon. Uh, should there be a an emergency, we'll follow the TTC rules, and we will call the control, and we will follow the instructions of the control operator. This engineering process started in 2016. Over 4,500 documents and calculations have been sent in. Uh, multiple CRR responses. We are down, down to down now, left with 28 items uh, as of two weeks ago, and some of those are are closed. So we want to start this work uh, in November. Sorry, Steve. And, just when you mentioned CRR responses, for those that don't know, those are design review comments that the TTC undertakes and provide feedback comments are. So the DTC are a part of the design and the construction review process. Okay, and last is the schedule. You can see the Eglinton schedule. Uh, November is when we want to we want to kick off at Eglinton. However, the support of the TTC box, that'll be the excavation down, doesn't start until between February and March. And uh, that's the support beam installation. In the meantime, the station at Allen will kick off uh, between January and February with the same process. Now, anybody from above, you'll never know we're doing it because we're going to be underground under the deck and people are going to uh, carry on as normal above. Thank you for your time. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free. Now's the time to ask them. It's quite impressive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Quite impressive. Now all you have to do is execute. Yeah. Yeah, the easy part. Right? The, the easy part. The engineering it was the tough part. Executing it will be the easy part. Okay. Anyone? Yes. Sorry. First. Sorry, man. Sorry. I, didn't see I wanted to ask about. I think disruption has been such a major issue on this, on this project. So you're saying, in your period, the November to November, you will be completely <coughs> underground. What's your access to that? Uh, I mean, is there still the disruption at the road level above? I mean, they'll be building the station, I should imagine. We have two areas of access where, where we will access that. Uh, on the east side, it's uh, just past where the BC <coughs> building is. There is uh, where the Salvation Army used to be, and we, we will rebuild. There's an area to access there between the condos. And then on the other side, we have a yard just west of the TTC station to the left where we will also access. We'll have two accesses in on that side. And so we'll, we'll be coming down from the side, and in, in, in November, you will see decking on both sides and the and effectively Eglinton return to its uh, final configuration with the exception of a, of a verge in the middle, we will have a construction support area. So the, so the roadway, the number of lanes and so on are restored by that time? By that time, yes ma'am. We'll still be building the station on the southwest corner, right? We'll, we'll be building the station and the excavation will be coming out of our yard uh, in uh, two locations, uh, Salvation Army and then the, and then the yard. Yes, ma'am. The disruption at Eglinton and Avenue Road has been very bad for shop owners, and now Eglinton and Youngs. But but it, I think of Eglinton Avenue Road, and you think of these little stores. 
um, that have actually you, you can hardly access them. Uh, we've discussed Allen, but what about Eglinton Avenue Road? Are those stores going to see daylight in the next three years before we open? Or we we recently uh, we we have approximately forty uh, structural piles left to do. Uh, we recently opened up an area on the north end of of Eglinton. Uh, on the northwest corner of Eglinton, it is open. Oh. Uh, it'll be much like the TTC. We've, we've gone to the west end where we we have approximately 30 days worth of work above, and then we will uh, build the deck and, and start below below ground. Both sides will be open. The sidewalks will be widened. But we're, we're even going to put in the bike lanes and open it up to traffic. Well, that'd be great. I mean, I, I know it's building transit is not pretty, but... Um I do feel for these store owners. Yeah. Uh, agreed. And, and we, we try very hard to work close with the store owners, with Metrolinx, to ensure that they're, they're inconvenienced uh, as little as possible. So, so one of the aspects in our, in our contractual agreement with Crosslinks is, is uh, door closures regime. Where it's just that. We, we kind of aim to minimize impact to businesses as much as possible. We have a communications relations, community relations team that work with these businesses to minimize the impacts. And that's very well embedded into our project agreement to minimise the impact of business. Is it totally avoidable? No, unfortunately not. But we do work hard to minimise those impacts. So w one of the things with these stations is we have to get this, what we call the SOE, the support of excavation in, in order to, uh, which is the piling around the outside of the station in order to allow us to construct. So the, the disruptions that you've seen over the last two years have been while that piling operation is underway. Uh, the intent on the plan is that when the piling is complete and the decking is in place, uh, we're below grade, we're underground, uh, the, uh, the roadway is returned to its original configuration as best as possible. We generally access, to, as Steve explained, at Eglinton from the uh, primary, the main and the secondary entrances, which are off to the north or south, depending on the specific station. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier on, uh, when we get the station built and we come back up to grade, obviously we have to go through another stage of traffic disruption while we build the final road construction, put the utilities in their final configuration, do the final paving and grading. Um, but the intent, hopefully within the next three to six months at the majority of the stations is we're as wide open as we can be for the next uh, 18 months to two years before what is we restore. Op what is the opening date for the whole crosslinks? Um, our, okay. our contractual completion date is the 29th of September 29, 2021. And we're on target for that. September 2021. Yep. Thank you. Sorry, you had a question. Right? Yeah, I did. Um, having spent my career in the insurance industry, even the best global minds never imagined the Calgary scenario. I know you addressed water, but my question is, it, it, through this, are we more vulnerable to an unimaginable water event, or are we similarly vulnerable to what we are today? As we are, uh, as what we are today, We'll be less vulnerable to it because underneath we will we will build temporary uh, drainage should a, a water event happen and we will have the pumping capacity on 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 site to be able to handle uh, a 10 year event or a 20 year event or have the ability to bring more in. We will we will channel water away from the structure that we're building and and capture it on either side. He, we're increasingly seeing 100-year and 500-year events. That's my question. Is, you know, the unimaginable is now happening, so are we more or less vulnerable? So I, I don't think that's um, o uh, overly a concern for us. Okay. The, 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 the support of the structure itself is not going to be impacted by water. By that, I mean the physical steel cradle that we're putting in. The area that is a concern is the retention of the soil on either side, north and south of the excavation. Yeah. That's the whole reason for that slow, small incremental measured approach to uh, doing that work. If something happens, if we see a flow either of water or soils, we can shotcrete that area and return it, uh, make it safe within minutes because we'll have all the equipment down there. Uh, if we get an unforeseen rain event, as, as Steve says, the intent is that we'll be, we'll be channeling that water away from the TTC box to both the east and the west, and we will have pumping regimes in place in those, uh, away from the box in those locations to control that water. So 
It's definitely a risk. There's no, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. But the way we're going about this is a measured step-by-step -step approach. Uh, we believe we have all the bases covered. This may be way off, but we've heard an awful lot in the news over the last few months around tariffs and, and steel. And so a big a question on my mind as a non-engineer is, are, is there any vulnerability or risk associated with the availability of steel for girders and beams and all of that that is clearly a part of what the big book, it is the part of what you're doing? Uh, not from the Metrolink side, yes, from our side. For your That's side. our risk. That's your risk. Something that's been, that we are dealing with at uh, Metrolinks and I.O. level, and we'll provide that feedback. Okay. So we are aware of it. We are dealing with the issue. Okay. And they're not worrying, so you are not worrying, Phil? Is that <laughs> close, close and very collaborative relationship. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much, gentlemen. That was a Thank you. Well done. Presentation. Thanks, Jeff. Oh, impressive. Thank you. Best wishes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, makes sense. So uh, that ends our uh, our public session. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming, um, and we'll uh, take a break for uh, 15 minutes. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm prepared for that.